Welcome to Scholarly Sedition with your host, Andrew Krishon. On today's first inaugural podcast, and my first inaugural podcast, I've never done a podcast before, we will be covering the early history of America. In the future, I hope to bring in guests and, and things like that, but for this podcast, I'm just going to go over some quotes said by the Founding Fathers, and then analyze a few of them a little. Some of them I'll just read read in their own. So, Albert Gallatin of the New York Historical Society, as the, the Bill of Rights was coming out, the U.S. Bill of Rights, not, not any of the state Bill of Rights, the U.S. one, in 1789, he said, The whole of the Bill of Rights is a declaration of the right of the people at large, or considered as individuals. You know, not group rights, but individual rights. With that last sentence being my commentary. So what does that mean in regard to the right to bear arms? Obviously, that means it's an individual right, according to Albert Gallatin, you know, the premier historian analyzing the Bill of Rights as it's coming out. Who better would understand the intent of the Bill of Rights than him? And uh, as Thomas Jefferson said, on every question of construction of the Constitution, let us carry ourselves back to the time when the Constitution was adopted. Recollect the spirit manifested in the debates, and instead of trying to trying what meaning what may be squeezed out of the text or invented against it, conform to the probable one in which it was passed. But you know, what does this mean to you or me? Do, do I care what the Bill of Rights means or what Thomas Jefferson thinks about how people should interpret it? Does the government care about this? I think to some extent it does. The American government, where there is an explicit constitutional limit on the government, you know, banning dissent and non state approved speech doesn't do it as often as, say, the UK, where this lim- this constitutional limit doesn't really exist, hasn't been recognized by the courts, whereas in the US it has. So, you know, it kind of depends on what the courts think, and then it depends on how much the executive is tied by the courts. We saw, you know, during Katrina and the oil spill, some federal judge issued an injunction to Obama, and Obama just ignored it. So, you know, these things... Uh, I don't think he'd ignore the Supreme Court, but he's supposed to follow all the federal courts when they issue injunctions, and he, he doesn't really. Maybe if they all started issuing injunctions, he would. I think the Bill, the bill of Rights matters to us today to some extent. It'd certainly be great if it were adopted by the government. And um, some people say that U.S. history has, has just been a downward spiral from this glorious moment when we rebelled against the British and passed the Bill of Rights and the government was libertarian, then it, got, it gets more and more status from there on out. That's certainly one interpretation of history. <coughs> but it doesn't really seem to be the correct one. Consider, on this episode of Scholarly Sedition, the Alien and Sedition Acts which were passed very shortly after the Bill of Rights. In, uh, in 1798, about 10 years later, the government was in the midst of an undeclared naval war. Sounds familiar? Yeah, we're doing that today. The Founding Fathers never would have had an undeclared war like Obama's done. Well, yeah, they, yeah, they would have. They did, you know. They called it a quasi-war, is how historians term it. Yeah, you know, this, I guess Libya is a quasi-war. I mean, it was pretty real if you were in Libya, but to the U.S. maybe. Anyway, there were all these xenophobic, you know, immigration restrictions put in, into place at about the same time the Naturalization Act increased the residency requirement for American citizenship. And don't kill me. I'm reading some of this off Wikipedia, you know, 
hey, I trust it more than the encyclopedias. I do. You know, from five to fourteen years. So the green card could would transition to citizenship back then, much better than today's system. But it took, you know, it used to take five years, and then it went to fourteen years. This is under Adams, you know, but the Congress, of course, right, writes the legislation, except for executive acts. So you know, this golden period didn't really exist. I think. Some people said the 10 years prior, well, you know, George Washington did round up an army and invade, you know, the rest of the country pretty much during the Whiskey Rebellion. It'd be kind of like if, you know, Obama took a bunch of National Guard troops from Massachusetts and marched them down to, you know, Texas to put down the militia there, the local government there, you know, a lot of these territories that rebelled in the Whiskey Rebellion didn't have real local governments. They were almost de facto anarchies. The militia, I guess, was the local government, and they rebelled against the whiskey tax and, you know, hanged tax collectors and stuff, and Washington came in with his troops and crushed them. So, you know, even in 1793, the Tenth Amendment, you know, and remember, if these things are supposed to talk about individuals, what does the Tenth Amendment even mean then? Does it mean... All powers not reserved to Congress are reserved to the individual. What about in regions that weren't states? You know, was the militia, the local, whatever de facto government there was, if you want to call it self-government or anarchy in some of these places in the far west. Historians have, have made that claim. Google the not-so-wild west. Anderson and Hill have a great history of that era. But this is, you know, far in the West that a few pockets Anderson and Hill have labeled anarcho-capitalisms back where the Constitution and Bill of Rights were, in effect, you know, they were failing miserably. The, you know, the central government was invading the local government, violating the Tenth Amendment. You know, they were... A central bank was passed when a strict reading of the Constitution didn't really allow for one. Undeclared wars then in 78 and the Sedition Acts. Sedition, what is that? What does that mean? What is the definition of sedition? That's, you know, let's go to the, the dictionary, not Wikipedia, but just the dictionary. Conduct or speech inciting people to rebel against the authority of a state or monarch. Conduct or speech inciting people to rebel against the authority of a state or monarch. And that sounds like, you know, any sort of speech that I'm interested in, you know, wasting my time watching on, you know, YouTube or Facebook or when I'm at work, you know, this is the type of stuff that interests me and I and I Google rebellion and things it's fascinating and i'm doing a podcast about it so anyway i guess just outlawing fun is what you know a law against sedition would mean to me but it's a terrible thing and it was passed right at the beginning of the bill of rights so the bill of rights failed very early very quick and then you know i guess the laws were repealed or something and you know, Lincoln jailed people for speaking out against them. The Espionage and Espionage Act, I believe, in seventeen, is still in effect, and people have been tried for it recently. Drake, um, the famous NSA leaker, because he leaked a document to the press, was tried for sedition. Let's go to, you know, news, Google News. Sedition. How is this being used worldwide? We go to the Malaysian Insider. Lawyers have, you know, ganged up to prosecute a DAP assembly man under the Controversial Sedition Act. This is in Malaysia. So this is a legislator who's being jailed 
by the prime minister, by the executive. So pretty much the executive is quashing the will of the legislator by jailing him for, you know, rebelling, I guess. Although legislature is rebelling against the executive. They're supposed to kind of own the executive. You know, the executive is supposed to be slave to the legislature. You know, the military, the police are not the highest power the legislature is in the in the, this constitutional theory that almost every country adopts nowadays they've kind of copycatted the founding fathers model to a, at least a vague extent and have a legislature and executive and the legislature rules the executive but in most countries that's kind of a sham and how you know the myth of state and i think the u.s that's true to a big extent so sedition is is used kind of as a dictatorial well prosecution against sedition is used as a dictatorial power grab in much of the world and I think this was a large part of the alien seditions acts too you know John Adams was prosecuting an undeclared war which is a dictatorial move and Congress you know squashing his dictatorial ambitions wasn't something he wanted, so he made, you know, criticism of himself, in fact. That was that was the definition of sedition, kind of, at the time, is if you criticize the president, he could jail you for it. And by doing this, he definitely put Congress in its place as well, because who got to determine who got jailed? That was the president. He's the executive chief cop. Congress could be jailed by the cops for... Or speaking out against the president and that limit their ability it, it's like you know Congress is supposed to be the master it's like the um, the master not being able to rule his his kingdom you know just a defective arm Congress becomes when the king emerges and I think some people have said it's better to just have a de facto monarchy Hoppe says that I think you might be able to make that argument for very small territories Disney World sized things where there's just you know absolute property rights owned by a single entity you know Disney World I think it would, you know like Luxembourg is like this and I think does relatively well under that system although even that king's limited to some extent I like the separation of powers, but especially on a large scale, just because dictators on a large scale are, have historically just always had the worst regimes in terms of body count. I mean, that's an empirical fact. And Hoppe, I guess, argues monarchy on the small scale, and I don't think he re really retracts that on the large scale. We're getting into Austrian economics now. Let's keep this about the NAP. <laughs> that, that was what Shanklin told me when he offered me the podcast. You know, try to keep it about the NAP. All right. So the non-aggression principle. How does that relate to all of this? The non-aggression principle. The foundation of libertarianism, I think. It's been identified, you know, recently, kind of Walter Block, I think, is the great, you know, prophet of this non-aggression principle, libertarian link, Rothbard, too, before him. And it, and so the word libertarianism has kind of been joined to this non-aggression principle. You know, who was Rothbard? He was Mr. Libertarian. He really defined the movement right there. He's present at the start of the Libertarian Party, Dave Nolan who really was an anarchist, is an anarchist. And Chris Cantwell has some good stuff about the Libertarian Party's anarchist leanings at its outset. The non-aggression the non principle means that no one gets special rights, first of all, under any principle, under any law. And Bastiat really originated this in its fullest that badges don't can't possibly grant rights since badges are in any just system what they represent you know if i if i really have a badge with real legitimacy behind it in 
it's like being, you know, maybe a mall cop could claim this, that the property owner in its fullest consents to what you're doing. If a neighborhood decides to, you know, all form a neighborhood association, you can, you can make the same argument, I think. But, you know, what what is where else would the badge draw its authority you know the higher power was used for the monarchy authority in europe that god you know created the badge created the crown which then delegated to the badge bastiat brings it this into you know real scrutiny and says if if the badge isn't protecting property you know as delegated by the property authority a representative government and such a thing, I, I fully believe, on a nationwide scale is impossible, where you won't have any pockets of, oh, I don't think I grant my property rights to you. It always has to be imposed by force, you know. Poor Rhode Island didn't want to join the Constitution. Congress permission threatened to declare war on them uh, if they didn't join. They, you know, said anyone headed to Rhode Island will be jailed for treason, and, you know, Rhode Island had to join... I don't, I don't think you can ever find a historical example of a large political entity that wasn't created, you know, through just extortion, just, you know, join, sign the social contract, or we'll invade, you know, some small ones, maybe, you know, you can go Google the history of Luxembourg, it's an interesting history, no, not Luxembourg, what am I thinking? Liechtenstein, I'm sorry. Anytime I've said Luxembourg in this podcast, go back and, and replace it with Liechtenstein. That's that's the monarchy that you know Hoppe loves and some Hoppe's fans have applied his theory to. It's like a very small, like Disney World sized monarchy in, in Europe. Good personal liberty, you know, respect them. And said they would allow sese- individual secession of property owners even at one point. But if for something as large as, you know, the United States, you know, and its constitution, and even something, I think, smaller like the state of New Hampshire, I think it could really only be, you know, the, a badge of a state police trooper could only really be just by, or could never really be just. So Bastiat said, look, the badge doesn't grant rights. If, the, if you, and, or I can't do something, the person with the badge can't. Because, you know, the individual property owner doesn't have any rights. It doesn't have special rights that some other person doesn't have. So, yeah, you can control what's happening on your property, but nowhere else, you know, you don't get to delegate power to some badge and then storms your neighbor's property and takes taxes from him or stops him from smoking weed or whatever. It's uh, it's not something you have the the power to do. And the policeman doesn't have the the moral power to do, the moral authority to do. And, you know, Bastiat is seldom identified as an anarchist. For some reason, anarchy is a very new term to the school of thought. The classical liberals, a lot of them, kind of identify with the school of thought, but were inconsistent when it came to some policies. You know, the libertarians, like Mises, approached it with no people and no part of a people shall be held against its will in a political association that it does not want. That's a quote by Mises. Rothbard kind of finalized it. Molinari preceded Rothbard, but wasn't very widely read. And Rothbard didn't, you know, coin the term libertarianism, but popularized it. Liberalism had been demolished at that point, stolen by the socialists. And so an old socialist term, libertarianism, kind of got picked up by, by this foundation of the individualist foundation of classical liberalism who, you know, some socialists such as Spooner had picked up on. And finally it was it was brought into this term libertarianism. So the Bill of Rights and the Constitution fail, so what, uh, you know, what is a libertarian government? I think it's a self-government. It's a government of myself, by myself, and for myself, and no one else. You know, you don't have any authority to rule me just because you have a badge. Some may call this anarchy. Anarchy gets mixed up into a lot of other things like egalitarianism. You know, between the sexes, like femi- uber feminism, where 
you know, men and women don't have any differences in society whatsoever. The average pay is the same for them, and all this stuff. Some like uber democracy and all, all these other theories get mixed up with anarchy, but uh, you know, real anarchy I think just means that self government is the norm instead of arbitrary invasion of property by the police. So, you know, the property owner, it self-governs. If he doesn't self-govern, then he is not really the property owner. His property has been stolen. And, you know, the state, kind of by its existence, has typically been very invasive of property to, to operate. It must, you know, extort people into paying them money to run its police force it a few states without taxation have been where you know fines are against real aggressors pay the police now, some libertarian authors have written about things of this nature early Ireland early Iceland you can call them stateless to some extent, but there is very much self-government. There is a system, indeed. There was a system, but competition existed. And so there was no true monopoly imposed on everybody in the same way, at least, as there is under a typical state. Now, maybe... Some people say anarchy is impossible, so we're always going to have some aggression, so let's minimize it. Let's have a, a minarchist state just because anarchy is like a square circle. It doesn't exist. It can't happen. Again, I recommend anyone read Hill and Anderson's paper, The Not-So-Wild West, David Friedman's work on early Iceland, Rivalry and Superior Dispatch, a paper that came out of George Mason University about competition in courts, in towns in early England, uh, different legal systems operating side by side, no monopoly. Anarchy in the Aiken about Ireland is a great paper. I recommend reading Pencil I think it's Pennsylvania's Anarchist History by Rothbard. I think these give glimpses of what a world where there is no, you know, violent aggressor against property in charge look like. And I think under, in those worlds, whether you want to call them true anarchies, I think they're closer to anarchy than what any state has produced. I think you make the argument that, and these scholars do make the argument that violence was very small compared to a state society, all state societies. So, self-government, taken to extreme, as Mises said, no people and no part of the people shall be held against its will in a political association that it does not want, is how to really enforce this notion Bastiat had. Of badges only representing rights, if they exist. So I can wear a badge that says, I have rights granted by me. I can police my property. If Joe allows me to police his property as a private security guard, I wear a badge that says, you know, me and Joe. I don't get to police Fred's property if he hasn't given me, you know, permission. And there's no president. And that, that's the kicker, is, you know, there's no presidential election. It would be a huge social change. God, maybe parts of the U.S. could secede and try this, you know. That will happen before the whole country goes this way. I'd love the whole country to go this way. I think as soon as part of the world tries it, the rest of the world's going to see so how superior it is that it won't be long before they catch up. Maybe it will never happen. Maybe the state will always exist. But how to how do we arrive at this system is another good question. 
or how do we at least preserve what little liberty we have what does the constitution give any advice the constitution is supposed to preserve liberty according to theory in theory at least does it at least give any advice for what happens under an unconstitutional government or does the constitution just assume there it will never be broken does it not plan for that scenario a few constitutions do not the federal constitution that doesn't but the new hampshire state constitution does it says under article 10 the bill of rights the right of revolution and new hampshire starts its constitution out with the bill of rights whereas the federal constitution added one kind of at the end as an afterthought under political pressure so article 10 of the new hampshire constitution the bill of rights says government being instituted for the common benefit protection and security of the whole community and not for the private interest or emolument of any one man family or class of men therefore whenever the ends of the government are perverted and the public liberty manifestly endangered and all other means of redress are ineffectual the people may and of right ought to reform the old or establish new government the doctrine of non-resistance against arbitrary power and oppression is absurd slavish and destructive of the good and happiness of mankind so resist is what the constitution says and it doesn't just say you know it's a great thing to resist it kind of says well you know look the doctrine of non-resistance people who disagree with us the doctrine of non-resistance against arbitrary power and oppression is absurd you know you're absurd if you are against resisting it's slavish you know you have a slave mentality you know mike shanklin kind of the godfather of this podcast uh, has this page a fantastic page statism is slavery great great term you know you're slavish slavish I, I don't know how to pronounce that word and destructive of the good and happiness of mankind it's kind of just a big you know whatever political philosophy you believe in no very few people openly say they want to destroy the good and happiness of mankind so it's just kind of a, an umbrella appeal to you know you're an asshole if you disagree <laughs> so i guess a little divisive you know it seems almost like cantwell could have written it <laughs> But, um, what does that mean? You know, how, how do you resist? Does it have to be violent resistance? The Founding Fathers obviously used a lot of violence, but maybe you can resist in your, your other actions, your peaceful actions, such as maybe using Bitcoin, using Tor to evade taxes, evade regulations through using the Silk Road. You know, the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto is a great, just a great, paper I recommend to anyone who is interested in peaceful ways to destroy the government's power because it predi uh, first of all the crypto anarchist manifesto was written in 1988 and here I'm googling it right now it is a document produced by Tim May that predicts the next 25 years to a T. So, you know, it's a great document just because of that. I don't care what your political philosophy is. It's, it's very accurate. Just fantastic document. It's not too long. I'll probably read it in its entirety here. I, I can't believe I promised Mike Shanklin an hour. I'm at the halfway mark now. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell I'm going to fill up the next 30 minutes with. But uh, The Crypto Anarchist Manifesto was written by Tim May to the cypherpunk movement. And cypherpunks also identified as crypto anarchists. You know, as crypto anarchists and cypherpunk were synonyms. Other famous cypherpunks were Satoshi Nakamoto, who my, my personal suspicion is Tim May, actually, but that's just a theory I have. But anyway, Satoshi Nakamoto was a cypherpunk. And he identifies as such. 
Uh, Tim Bell is another famous cypherpunk, uh, author of Assassination Politics. Tim May, famous cypherpunk. Uh, Werner Vinge was kind of the predecessor and godfather to the cypherpunk movement. His book on anarcho-capitalism, The Ungoverned. Fantastic book. And the cypherpunk movement you know, is anarcho-capitalist. Crypto-anarchists are anarcho-capitalists. Cody Wilson might disagree. He's gotten kind of a little leftist from, from my taste lately, but Tim May, you know, the person who really fleshed out crypto-anarchism and wrote the manifesto in 1988, identifies as a crypto-anarchist in, in uh, stateless societies, uh, one of those books. Contact me if you want the source on that one. And he says it is crypto. It's not, you know, freedom from inequality or something silly like many anarchists say. It's, you know, anarcho capitalism that no one else governs your property but you. You know, and your property being your data. So crypto encryption, encryption of the data means that only you can unencrypt it. It's privacy from state invasion. And when in a world where data becomes the most important form of property, then encryption means anarchy because the state can't get at it. The state can't control what it doesn't know. And so let me read to you the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto written in 1988. A specter is haunting the modern world, the specter of crypto anarchy. Computer technology is on the verge of providing the ability for individuals and groups to communicate and interact with each other in a totally anonymous manner. Two persons may exchange messages, conduct business, and negotiate electronic contracts without ever knowing the true name or legal identity of the other. Interactions over networks will be untraceable via extensive rerouting of encrypted packets and tamper-proof boxes which implement cryptographic protocols with nearly perfect assurance against any tampering. Reputations will be of central importance, far more important in dealings than even the credit ratings of today. These developments will com alter completely the nature of government regulation, the ability to tax and control economic interactions, the ability to keep information secret, and will even alter the nature of trust and reputation. The technology for this revolution, and it surely will be both a social and economic revolution, has existed in theory for the past decade. The methods are based upon public key encryption, zero-knowledge interactive proof systems, and various software protocols for interaction authentication and verification. The focus has until now been on academic conferences in Europe and the US, conferences monitored closely by the National Security Agency. But only recently have computer networks and personal computers attained sufficient speed to make the ideas practically realizable, and the next 10 years will bring enough additional speed to make the ideas economically feasible and essentially unstoppable. High-speed networks, ISDN, tamper-proof boxes, smart cards, satellites, Q-band transmitters, multi-MIPS personal computers, and encryption chips now under development will be some of the enabling technologies. The state will, of course, try to slow or halt the spread of this technology, citing national security concerns, use of the technology by drug dealers and tax evaders, and fears of societal disintegration. Many of these concerns will be valid. Crypto anarchy will allow national secrets to trade freely and will allow illicit and stolen materials to be traded. An anonymous computerized market will even make possible abhorrent markets for assassinations and extortion. Various criminal and foreign elements will be active users of CryptoNet, but this will not halt the spread of crypto anarchy. Just as the technology of printing altered and reduced the power of medieval guilds and the social power structure, so too will cryptologic methods fundamentally alter the nature of corporations and of government interference in economic transactions. Combined with emerging information markets, crypto anarchy will create a liquid market for any and all material which can be put into words and pictures, and just as a seemingly minor invention like barbed wire made possible the fencing off of vast ranches and farms, thus altering forever the concepts of land and property rights in the frontier west, 
so too will this seemingly minor discovery out of an arcane branch of mathematics come to be the wire clippers which dismantle the barbed wire around intellectual property. Arise, you have nothing to lose but your barbed wire fences. Timothy May. And an unknown date in 19, the summer of 88. And Timothy May kind of went missing around the time when Satoshi Nakamoto appeared. So no one really knows where he is to contact him and ask him exactly when he wrote this. As I've been trying to do. I'm still trying to track him down and get my deep net stuff set up because I've heard he makes appearances in certain deep net chat rooms from time to time. I'd love to interview the guy. Yeah, how how would that be for a podcast? I'll interview Tim May. Maybe he'll come out as Satoshi Nakamoto. <laughs> no, that's just a crazy theory I have. I don't even think anyone else has the theory that, that Tim May is Satoshi Nakamoto. But anyway, I guess uh, I have 25 minutes to kill on this podcast, and I'll just spend it discussing the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto. Uh... It was the first half of the podcast, I guess, was involving the founding fathers and, you know, early America and, and liberty and, and stuff of that nature. But I kept on asking, how does it apply? How does it apply? Well, you know, he maybe here's how it applies. I mean, there's certainly, you know, other ways to resist besides crypto anarchy. You know, old fashioned ways the founding fathers would have used in that. <laughs> that I don't want to discuss too in too much details, <laughs> so I don't go to prison or anything. But uh, you know, scholarly sedition. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not a- actually trying to get arrested for sedition, um, though it's such a goddamn ambiguous thing. <laughs> I'm not not sure. Maybe I will, because uh, they they can't. You know, Ho- hopefully they'll go after some lower hanging fruit than me first, like. Uh, Santelli, the guy who kind of, the media guy who kind of orchestrated the, the Bundy situation. You know, the media guys always orchestrate every every physical revolution. Uh, Sam Adams pretty much started the whole Boston Boston Tea Party. He ran the Gazette, the Boston Gazette, and you know the Boston Tea Party was planned in the, the neighbors' back rooms. You know, pretty much to troll the British into getting them to put, you know, uh, to react back and very provocative, kind of like Cody Wilson being provocative. So anyway, hopefully I won't get arrested for, for sedition. <laughs> or at least I'll see other people getting arrested first and know, know to get the hell out of the U.S. Where would I go? I don't know. Maybe Russia? Putin seems to be nice to <laughs> to people being charged with sedition. You know, he took Snowden in. Um, at least U.S. people. <laughs> and just don't criticize him when you get there because he arrests everyone in Russia who exercises sedition. Or just poison them. Anyway. The Crypto Anarchist Manifesto. Getting getting back, I said I'd discuss that for the remainder of the podcast. So let's go through it, you know, line by line. Let's talk about how Tim May's predictions came true and specifically, you know, how what they mean for liberty. And sedition. Because that's what the podcast is about, after all, I guess. Scholarly sedition. So Computer technology is on the verge of providing the ability for individuals and groups to communicate and interact with each other in a totally anonymous manner, is what May wrote in his first sentence, and, and it has now. You know, Tor. Two persons may exchange messages, conduct business, and negotiate electronic contracts without ever knowing the true name or legal identity of the other. And electronic contracts, really, getting set up is something that is a bit lacking in implementation compared to other aspects of this armory now is multi-sig transaction so escrow can begin being used with bitcoin and ethereum if that's actually going to be a thing is coming out soon uh, ostensibly <laughs> um so electronic contracts in the sense of just you know verbal contracts uh, sent electronically were written contracts sent electronically yeah but true self-enforcing electronic contracts, which I think is what May was really getting at with that sentence, are probably a year or two away. Interactions over 
networks, oh, this is the next sentence, interactions over networks will be untraceable via extensive rerouting of encryption, encrypted packets and tamper-proof boxes which implement cryptographic protocols with nearly perfect assurance against any tampering. This is Tor. And the only party's wrong is nearly perfect assurance. There's complete perfect assurance if you use, you know, 256-bit encryption. You can always encrypt better, faster than you can unencrypt, so any encryption breaking software the NSA develops will always be exponentially far behind just the power it takes to bump up the encryption a level to beat it. You know, just move to 1086 or whatever they're at, go up to 10,000 bit encryption, you know, require the NSA to have a computer as big as the universe to even begin thinking about disencrypting it. This this can be done with poor computers today. Encryption is very memory, you know, not very intense in terms of capital required to invest in computers, so perfect assurance against tampering. Reputations will be of central importance in the Silk Road. Uh, this is the next sentence. Reputations will be of central importance, so he obviously predicts the Silk Road with that part. Far more, because that was reputation based, far more important in dealings than even the credit ratings of today. These developments will alter completely the nature of government regulation, the ability to tax and control economic interactions, the ability to keep information secret, and will even alter the nature of trust and reputation. Well, the nature of trust and reputation is definitely altered in that you, an anonymous entity has trust. Who that is, how many people it is, really completely unknown, and you could always create as many of these anonymous entities as you want, but that anonymous entity gains trust. So yeah, this is how the Silk Road operates, or its spin-offs. You know, the Silk Road went down, but there's, you know, a thousand flowers blooming, plenty of other online marketplaces. And the government, you know, can't control what it doesn't know. It, it can't regulate tax or control int economic interactions, as May predicted. It can't keep information secret. You know, Snowden, the, the London government tried to invade... The Guardian and it destroyed the Snowden files. Big whoop! They have it up on the encrypted cloud. You know, there is a uh, there is zero ability. The more that is moved online and encrypted, the less the government can control anything. The less the government sees even exists. The government, you know, a group of people issuing orders when the orders don't mean anything, aren't a government. So we can end the, the state's existence and get back to a more libertarian, not getting back as in the founding was libertarian, but you know, get, get to a more libertarian reality. That's just the first paragraph. So accurate, yeah, let's move on. The technology for this revolution, and it surely will be both a social and economic revolution, has existed in theory for the past decade. The methods are based upon public key encryption, zero-knowledge interactive proof systems, and various software protocols for interaction, authentication, and verification. And this is, um, this is Bitcoin, pretty much, and, and all, you know, the encrypted chat software. Tor, you know, they all use this technology. Moving on. The focus has until now been on academic conferences in Europe and the U.S. Conferences monitored closely by the National Security Agency. Yes, the NSA was very interested in the cypherpunks and the crypto anarchists, and they've always remained interested in encryption. The feds tried to ban encryption briefly in the 90s. Um, PGP encryption, look up the Wikipedia article on PGP for more on that. Because, you know, encryption is the enemy of the NSA. It is. The cypherpunks are the arch enemy of the NSA, the crypto anarchists. It's like a, you know, villain and hero sort of thing for liberty. Moving on. But only recently have computer networks and personal computers attained sufficient speed to make the ideas practically realizable. And really, you know, it would be 20 years before the average person can afford a computer to really implement Bitcoin, but and the next 10 years will bring enough additional speed to make the ideas economically feasible and essentially unstoppable. Yeah, you know, really the next 20 years, I think he was a little too optimistic, but he didn't miss too much.
High-speed networks, ISDN, tamper-proof boxes, smart cards, satellites, Kuban transmitters, multi-MIPS personal computers, and encryption chips now under development will be some of the enabling technologies. He is accurate. Third paragraph out of five. Fifteen minutes to fill. <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll go slower. The state will, of course, try to slow or halt the spread of this technology, citing national security concerns, use of the technology by drug dealers and tax evaders, and fears of societal disintegration. The state did, of course, try to slow and halt the spread of this technology. Encryption was almost banned in the 90s. The state still treats encryption as a munition. The state forced Cody Wilson to take his plans for 3D printed guns offline. The state forces you to unencrypt in certain instances in court, or you'll be disobeying a court order. The state tries to, you know, get rid of any leaked classified material, national security concerns. You know, the more the people know, the less powerful the state is, because secrets are power, information is power, knowledge is power. The technology has been used by drug dealers and tax evaders, who, you know, after all, the drug dealer is just using his property, the tax evader is just keeping his property by libertarian standards, by standards of personal liberty. You know, the person leaking national security secrets, well, you know, Snowden, you know, what property is he violating by leaking this? the US government is illegitimate so a contract with it can be broken without you know infringing on just moral authority just moral property and then he, may goes on and says many of these concerns will be valid crypto anarchy will allow national secrets to be traded freely and will allow illicit and stolen materials to be traded indeed the black market that's now enabled on tour you know has no morality police and anything can be traded who knows I, I don't know for certain but I would suspect slaves are being traded on that by now so this isn't some sort of oh all of humanity's moral problems will be solved you know a person can still be stolen from beaten enslaved by his neighbor but some general government won't be doing it if that general government doesn't exist is withered away by becoming powerless it's not a utopia but it is a better world may goes on an anonymous computerized market will even make possible abhorrent markets for assassinations and extortion. Markets for murder, hitmen markets. And indeed, you can just see how May's prediction has come true by looking up the, the Forbes magazine article. Let me just Google it real quick. Um, the article is titled, <laughs> I've probably looked at this article so many times, I'm on all sorts of NSA lists. You have a show called Scholarly Sedition, Andrew, of course you're on NSA lists. <laughs> Alright, so the article is titled, Meet the Assassination Market Creator Who's Crowdfunding Murder with Bitcoins. So this is what May predicts, you know, it's happening. You know, <laughs> Everyone's got a, a price. Bernanke's got one. It's uh, you know, May's theories come true, and May says it's abhorrent that this will happen. Tim Bell, another cypherpunk, is more friendly towards <laughs> the idea. He says that's how government's gonna wither away. You know, Konkin, kind of the agorism godfather of of the crypto anarchy movement. Konkin, kind of was very influential on Vinge, who was very influential on the cypherpunks. Uh, Kagan discussed how the state would be withered away kind of by this method. Um, and I'm not going to obviously endorse it or I'd be arrested, but, uh, you know, there's a... I'll probably get kicked out of Porkfest for this anyway. 
but you know so these, this is just how to dis- discuss you know the the intellectual thought around this you have, you have to understand what the cypherpunk movement was what crypto anarchy was whether you don't have to endorse these things just understand what the early history and you know tim bell it was a, cri- a, fa- a founding cypherpunk who was very influential and so you can't deny that just because his stuff is so controversial and their predictions were right so they're of note because their predictions are right you don't have to be a crypto anarchist to to you know agree that their predictions were correct so may goes on various criminal and foreign elements will be active users of crypto net but this will not halt the spread of crypto anarchy criminal and foreign elements <laughs> sounds like you know some sort of senate committee hearing by you know aspiring senator criminal and foreign elements are using crypto net you know feinstein maybe so you know of course the government will try to stop this and of course there'll be all sorts of terrible terrible stuff you know going on just look up the bitlocker virus you know it's a horrible thing Uh, but, you know, th- this is just a force of nature at this point. The government would have to shut off the Internet, which it probably is capable of doing if it, if it just uses nuclear weapons against its own people, but which really it doesn't want to, and to some extent can't. So, you know, this is withering away at the state. The last paragraph. Nine minutes to go. I'll have to really go through this one slow. Just as the technology of printing altered and reduced the power of medieval guilds and the social power structure, so too will cryptologic methods fundamentally alter the nature of corporations and of government interference in economic transactions. Combined with emerging information markets, crypto-anarchy will create a liquid market for any and all material which can be put into words and pictures. So printing altered and reduced the power of medieval guilds and the social power structure. Here, here's one thing I think May missed was 3D printing, or he would have referenced it because it fits in here perfectly. Is So the 2D printer kind of completely altered the power structure of Europe. You know, the Bible was used to govern Europe and no one could read it because it was only in Latin and copied by monks. Then versions of the Bible in the local language came out and could be read by the masses. Protestantism emerged. The medieval guilds who did the the printing and had the monopoly on copying and being literate, the monks lost their power. So the 3D printer, you know, destroys the guilds of today, the corporate complex sanctioned by the state on firearm manufacture, the patent complex, you know, sanctioning certain producers who are in the patent system and outlawing others who aren't. You know, this guild structure, the union guild structure on the monopoly on labor being used to produce things. 3D printers really disempower the guilds of today. And 3D printing coupled with crypto anarchy means, so for instance, Cody Wilson's gun design you put up on the web can never be taken down because of crypto anarchy. And Cody Wilson is a great crypto anarchist. He you know, he's a little too anti-capitalism for me, but he, um, I like Konkin. He, uh, you know, goes into how the state can never take away these designs. The state can outlaw 3D printers. They're very do-it-yourself now, though. In fact, I, I predict the fall of the Chinese state, or at least Chinese totalitarianism, with regards to political speech. I predict the fall of that probably within the next couple of years because of 3D printing and crypto anarchy tour and all that. So there is a um, a huge power shift going on, you know, similar to the power shift when ri- when literature became widely available due to the, the pr- 2D printer and crypt- you know cryptologic methods, as May puts it, are completely intertwined with this revolution, and the revolution is impossible without it. Combined with emerging information markets. And probably the majority of stuff that's being traded now is information, even in the state-sanctioned market. Crypto-anarchy will create a liquid market for any and all material which can be put into words and pictures. And, you know, scarce material, of course. So bitcoins, you know, can be encrypted. 
designs for gums, you know. And there's a joke on Reddit, um, you know, you can encrypt your design for a uh, dildo, you can encrypt it with a double wall partition so that when the feds see it and force you to encrypt it, you unencrypt a gun. You do this in Mississippi, you know, or Iran. And up north in Massachusetts, you disencrypt it and have it be a dildo when, you know, it's really a gun. <laughs> so it depends on whether you're in a left or right state. You can use double partitions that way, but, you know, there's there's no way the government can control anything that can be put into words or pictures, which is money now, Bitcoin, which is all sorts of physical things now because of 3D printing. National secrets, Snowden. Beyond the state's control. And just as a seemingly minor invention like barbed wire made possible the fencing off of vast ranches and farms, thus altering forever the concepts of land and property rights of the frontier west. So too will the seemingly minor discovery out of an arcane branch of mathematics come to be the wire clippers which dismantle the barbed wire around intellectual property. The death of intellectual property is what May predicts, and May's prediction has come true. There is no more intellectual property in music. Some people choose to pay for music, but you do not have to. There is no more intellectual property for anyone who has a 3D printer and patents uh, for what it can print, and 3D printers are getting better all the time. 3D printers are printing houses now. You know, Metal 3D printers can make fully functioning AK-47s. You know, patents, intellectual property, you know, the crypto net, as May puts it, Tor, as we would call it today, destroys all of this. It is similar to, you know, going back in time and reversing the flow of time bet between when you had property for ranchers with fences and then when you didn't before them. And I think Colorado still has, you know, you have to put up a fence to keep cows off your property. It can still freely range instead of having to put up a fence to keep your cows on property. But, you know, so property is really defined by technology. And this technology changes everything. It, um, certainly, get, getting back, I guess, to the first part of this podcast, the old-fashioned, you know, the founders and, and all that, it certainly merges the First and Second Amendment. When the government tells Cody Wilson that he's not allowed to publish 3D printed gun designs on his website, they're infringing on his speech. It'd be insane to argue otherwise, but the government must do this if it wants to control guns. It has traditionally disrespected the hell out of the Second Amendment. And um, it is now, you know, just in order to maintain its monopoly on infringing the Second Amendment, in order to keep that line in the sand if we get to control your guns, you know, which it was losing the power to do with 3D printed, and as metal 3D printers come become cheaper, you know, really the government's ability to control fully automatic weapons is going to become null and void. So it has to draw this line in the sand, but it's, a, first of all, it thinks it has to, but really, it shouldn't have, and it's a failed attempt, because once something's on the internet, you can't take it down because of crypto anarchy, because of Tor, you know, uh, barring some fundamental change to the structure of the internet, you know, maybe an EMP blast, and then the government invades everywhere and prevents people from setting up decentralized net and puts a more central, you, you know, you'd have to have crazy nightmare situation to ever get these things off the internet. So they're there for good, they're there to stay. And, um, the First and Second Amendment are kind of blurred now into just liberty is the same thing. And the government can't control it. Freedom of the press for the 21st century means the right to bear arms and produce your own arms. 3D printing. Freedom of the press, you know, means the freedom to submit information online, to send information online. But that, in turn, means monetary freedom because of encrypted money, because of Bitcoin. Complete monetary freedom and death of taxation. These things are all, you know, coming into being because of crypto anarchy. And, you know, some of the more seditious parts of what the founders wrote or what, um, what Tim Bell 
preached might end up coming true. I won't get into them. I'm not trying to get arrested for a sedition, but uh, even if they don't, I think the state might still disappear very shortly, maybe 10 years, maybe five years, maybe tomorrow, I don't know. Maybe when Glenn Beck becomes an anarchist, the state will finally go. Anyway, um, at the hour mark, so signing off. <laughs>